Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank you for your presence here. I am the host of this session, and the subject of this session is the chemistry of vaping, or I would say even physical chemistry of vaping. The other person that delivers a lecture today is Professor Roberto Sussman from Mexico. He is not present in Poland. He will be present online. Hi. Hello, everybody. <clears throat> okay, can we start the presentation? Okay, so my name is Mirosław Dworniczak. I am known here in Poland as an old chemist. You can see. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you cannot see that I am a chemist, but believe me, I am. Uh, for 25 years, I was working at university. Then and I became a freelance journalist. And I am familiar with the subject of electronic cigarettes since 2008. And I'm also a vapor. So let me quote the famous Professor Michael Russell, father of tobacco harm reduction. People smoke for the nicotine, but they die from the tar. So at his time, there were only cigarettes, cigars, pipe present. There were no pure nicotine to be inhaled present. Unfortunately, Professor Michael Rasa is dead already. So I'm pretty sure he would be a part of this conference. The objective of delivering nicotine is to deliver certain amounts of nicotine without the burden of tar TSNAs, it's tobacco specific nitrosamines, CO, so carbon monoxide, etc. So the question is, how? How could we achieve this? But first, a few words about nicotine. Nicotine molecule. It's an organic compound. It belongs to the class of alkaloids. And it's stimulant and axiolytic. Usually, extract, it's extracted from tobacco plant. But it's present also in many plants from nightshade family like tomato, potato, eggplant, pepper. And nicotine protects plants from pests. So it's a nat natural pesticide. Its structure is depicted here. The green balls are carbon atoms, the blue balls uh, nitrogen atoms and the gray ones are uh, hydrogen atoms. Toxicity. Well, nicotine is of course classified as a poison, but as the father of modern medicine, Paracelsus said, sola dosis facit venenum, so only the dose makes the poison. Until recent years, the lethal dose, we can find it in most of the textbooks, was around 60 milligrams for an adult person, and roughly half that dose for a kid or a pet. But several, several years ago, Professor Bernd Meyer, toxicologist from Austria reviewed these sources and plenty of cases 
of nicotine poisoning and he claimed after studying at least a hundred of cases uh, that it is at least 10 times higher. So it would be 500 to 1500 milligrams, of course, except for children and pets. Nicotine is quite similar to caffeine. You have those two molecules depicted here, it's nicotine on the left, caffeine on the right. In the case of caffeine, we have additional two oxygen atoms, but both are classified as alkaloids. Okay, so let's go to vaping. Let's consider pure nicotine inhalation. What do you think? Is that a, something that could be good for our health? I guess you can inhale pure nicotine, but only once. So it's a bad idea. So what could be the solution? And the answer is yes, solution. We have to dilute like nicotine and that's it. So when you dilute something in something, we prepare a solution. So we have solute, in this case nicotine and the solvent. So we have to choose a carrier or a solvent. What we have to consider from the physico-chemical point of view? First, and the most important, health and toxic toxicity. The solvent should be healthy. Then, boiling point. It, could, it should not be too low and it should not be too high. And third, viscosity. If it's too viscous, we have to get rid of that or change the viscosity. I will refer to that a bit later. So the first possible solvent, water. Well, water is miscible with nicotine easily, but its boiling point is much, much too low, and its viscosity is also too low. So we exclude water. And after, I guess, several years, they have chosen, those producers of e-liquids, chosen several solvents and their mixtures for the preparation of, of e-liquid. The first is propylene glycol. It's non-toxic and it was already used in some pharmaceutical preparation. For example, cyclosporin for the patients after lung transplant. So it must be <coughs> non-toxic. The other one is glycerol. Also known as glycerin or vegetable glycerin, sometimes shortened to VG. It produces thicker cloud. It's a bit more viscous than propylene glycol. The third one, Right now it's not used frequently, only sometimes some, some producers use it. It's PEG, polyethylene glycol. It's quite similar to propylene glycol. It is a bit more viscous. By the way, the nicotine concentrations, if we talk about the 
solution in European Union is limited to 20 milligrams per milliliter. We are not allowed to sell more concentrated solution. Why? Is it because there are some scientific proof? Well, in fact, no one knows. Several years ago, before the implementation of TPD, here in Poland, on the market, we had much more concentrated solution, well, not, not very much more, but I know plenty of people who started vaping before TPD, myself included. Many of them used more concentrated liquids. 36 milligram per milliliter, it was a concentration uh, that was quite popular in Poland. And if someone was a heavy smoker, I know, for example, people who smoked 50 cigarettes a day, so they needed much more nicotine that we can get from 20 milligram per milliliter uh, solution. And believe me or not, no one was harmed. No one. And most of those people gradually went from 36 to 24, to 12, to 3. I know at least two people, they went to zero. So when we are talking about uh, the chemistry of vaping, we have to consider also flavors. And flavors are quite complicated mixtures of various organic compounds. And on the market we have, I don't know, of maybe even over a thousand of various flavors. It's very nice because everyone can choose their own taste. <laughs> oh. Oh, thank you. Okay, so we have those flavors. And I will not talk about uh, the chemistry of flavors because it would be, at first, quite obscure. And then there are not many studies on flavors and flavor fate during vaping. But there are also water and ethanol. I mentioned already that water as a solvent is not very good, but both water and ethanol, spirit, they are used for fine tuning of viscosity. So if we get our liquid will be too viscous, then we can add a drop or two drops, one to two percent of water or even 0 0.5 percent of ethanol to make it much, much less viscous. Now something about the bad guys. There are several bad guys that should not be present. I even say must not be present in electronic liquids. The first is diacetyl. It's an artificial butter flavoring. If you are buying popcorn, usually there is a bit of diacetyl there, but it can cause, in, if we inhale diacetyl, it can cause so-called popcorn lung, or medically speaking, bronchiolitis obliterans. 
It has obstruction of the smallest airways. That's why we don't use diacetyl while making liquids. The other one is acetyl propionyl. And that's a uh, substance a bit similar chemically to diacetyl. It gives also buttery flavor. And the third one from the list of bad, bad guys is acetoin. It gives buttery caramel flavor. And both of those compounds can cause fibrosis or even necrosis of the respiratory tract. So they should not, they must not be used in liquids. And then there is a special case. I will say a few words about it. It's vitamin E acetate, chemically speaking, tocopheryl acetate. It's an oily substance, not soluble in water, and it damages lungs. Uh, it causes Ivali. Probably some of you uh, have heard about it. It's e-cigarette or vaping associated lung injury. Vitamin E acetate is not used in commercially commercial liquids, but it's usually used for creating illegal liquids containing tetrahydrocannabinol THC and its derivatives. And we've heard of about over 2,000 cases. Several of them resulted in death. So it's a substance that absolutely must not be used while making e-liquids. Uh, please, maybe a bit later, after both presentations, we have question and answer session. Uh, incidentally, vitamin E acetate is widely used in dermatology. It's a fantastic thing. As a topical medication, it's safe to use this compound but only externally. Now, a few words about chemistry. Chemical reactions. Glycerol, when it's used in e-liquid, decomposes at 280 centigrades, and it produces acrolein. Many people are very allergic to acrolein. So overheating is not good. If we have glycerin in our liquid, then don't try to overheat it. It's very dangerous for those people that are known as cloud chase chasers, those who love the thick and very, very big cloud of after, after inhaling, and it's done using low resistance coil, high power, and of course it results with high temperatures, sometimes even over 300 degrees. So there is uh, there is decomposition of many, many ingredients in e-liquid. Acrolein, also acetoin, acetylpropionyl, diacetyl, they all contain carbonyl group. Carbonyl group, carbon atom, oxygenate atom double bond. So the compounds with compounds contain, containing carbonyl group are bad guys. As you can see, uh, three bad guys depicted by my daughter. The simplest, the simplest 
carbon group compound, compound containing carbon group is formaldehyde. Probably most of you heard of it because it's present everywhere. It's present in ambient air. It's present, for example, in high concentrations in so-called MDF, medium density fiberboard. Uh, it's used to produce, for example, furniture. There is a resin containing urea and formaldehyde. And it releases formaldehyde for two years, five, even ten years, slowly releases formaldehyde and your rooms are full with formaldehyde. Okay, now typical mixture used as a base, as a solvent for e-liquid is a PG propylene glycol, PG vegetable glycerin mixture. What are the reactions in such a mixture when it goes up from the container to the wick and it's, there is 180, 200 degrees. Fortunately, in 2021, scientific reports I found a very nice source about telling us about low temperature so it's less than 200 degrees degradation of electronic nicotine delivery systems so e-cigarettes liquids toxic aldehydes of course, this is mainly for chemists, but, but as you can see, there are plenty of those carbonyl group present in those compounds. Acrolein, acrylic acid, acetaldehyde, formaldehyde, and this is only when we have only the decomposition of glycerol. When we have glycerol and propylene glycol, then those pathways are interlaced. So there are many, many more compounds. But remember one very important thing. Those compounds are present in a very, very small quantities. About the quantities Professor Sussman will tell some words. And also we can find heavy metals, not in the liquid, but in those vapor that we inhale. For example, nickel and chromium, they can cause allergy. I know of several cases in Poland of nickel allergy. And coil or heating element is usually made of cantal. A cantal is an alloy of iron, chromium, small amounts of aluminium and cobalt. But Professor Roberto Sussman will go into details as far as heavy metals are concerned. So let me sum up. Although liquids are quite simple, their chemistry or chemistry of vaping is usually complicated, complicated from the chemical point of view. So it's not easy to study it. Some compounds may be dangerous underline may be, but they are present in small amounts. And again, as Paracelsus said, only 
the dose makes the poison. Nevertheless, e-cigarettes are far less dangerous than regular cigarettes. 95%, 97%, maybe even more. Because cigarette smoke contains over 70,000 chemicals. And of them, over 50 are carcinogens. And a few words to the journalists. I don't know whether they are present here or not, but please, if you are not sure about your knowledge of chemistry, so please try to consult your texts with someone familiar with the subject. Every week or every month I find a text by someone that finds, for example, oh boy, there is a paper, they are stating that formaldehyde is present. One part in 10 billion, but it's present. And that's it. That's why it's good to consult those texts with someone knowing chemistry, knowing medicine, someone familiar with the subject. Thanks for your attention. Thanks for your patience. Okay, and now... Okay, okay, okay. This is... I know, I know, I know everything. I know everything, okay. A short interruption. Here. And which which way do I face Sir Robert? Oh, there we are. There's the camera. Come, come here. Come uh, here. Just come here. Roberto. Hi. Hi. Come around. Uh. <laughs> Roberto. So my name is Charles Gardner. I'm the executive director of INCO. Uh, Roberto and I know each other very well. Roberto, we have something we would like to uh, tell you, which is that this year, INCO is awarding you the Professional Advocate of the Year. And this is a big honor for, for us. We're recognizing your contributions to this field for many years. And, uh, and a, it's also a, a symbol of our great affection for you. So well, thank you, you, will, you will receive a, a much nicer plaque. <laughs> um, but uh, we, have a, we have a facsimile, a mock-up uh, here. So thank you for your work, sir. Well, thank you very much for the award. Uh, I'm happy about that. You can give your award acceptance speech now. Ha! <laughs> ha <laughs> All right, we love you and thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. And uh, it is uh, four o'clock in the morning here in Mexico City. So, yeah. if I fall asleep, please forgive me. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt you. No problem. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Sorry. Okay. So, just just a few words before before I let Roberto speak. Well, probably some of you know that some of you know Roberto. Some of you know that Roberto is a physicist, a cosmologist. I was just searching his publications, something like gravitational entropies in LTB dust models. The space-time associated with galactic dark matter hollows. Quite complicated, but then I found pancakes as opposed to Swiss cheese. <laughs> so I dig into that, and that was also cosmology. <laughs> okay, Roberto. It was not... The floor is not, yours. It was not a cooking recipe. <laughs> okay, so... Um, um, thank you very much. I'm going to share the screen. And uh, 
here go to the universe of electronic cigarettes. Uh, yes, I, I hope I'm doing the right. Can, can you see me? Can you see my slide? Yes, you, we can see your slide. You, we cannot see you. Okay. So, uh, okay, let, as the Americans say, let's rock and roll. Okay. So, first, would like to thank uh, the organizers of, uh, uh, of, uh, of the GFN for having this uh, very interesting event. And uh, I'm going to concentrate where middle is from in methods and practicals because uh, it, I, this is more physics and chemistry, but as Mira said, it is really physical, chem physical chemistry. Okay, so uh, let's say something. Uh, methods in the e-cigarette in, in actually are a legitimate concern, right? And, uh, however, a method in the aerosol has been also a very frequent and scary alarm that is voiced by the detractors of vaping. So it is important to have very clearly what the science is saying, right? Okay, so uh, hold on one second um, here. Okay, so uh, or this. Okay, so uh, is it true that they are feeling their long with heavy metals? Uh, uh, that, uh, yes. uh, if it was true, then it would be very bad because some of the metals, as Mirek mentioned, some people are allergic to them and they can produce very, uh, very world hazards. Like uh, some metals can produce neurotoxicity or other sorts of health problems, right? So, uh, let's see if this is true. How come there are methods in electronic figures? How do they come? How do they come? Where, where do they come? Well, first of all, our, the coils are made of different metal alloys, right? And also, e-liquid might contain some impurities, some trace level impurities of metal. Because metal comes in the air, right? So even plants and many of and we when we are breathing, we are breathing metals. Metal didn't come from another galaxy. They they are natural ingredients of the air, right? So they are they can be a security in the liquids as well. So you we can identify two interfaces where metal can be exchanged from the coil to air and from e-liquid to air and I could say also from the coil to e-liquid right, these are interfaces now to understand things we, we should look at the physics of surfaces right, surfaces is very interesting uh, environment now here okay here we have a point and from the Fundamental level, 
at the level of the molecule, you can see that the, the atom, for example, are very tightly packed, right? They, they are bound by intermolecular forces. And uh, if you take a map, uh, an atom here, which is surrounded by many other atoms, so their mobility is very limited. They are very packed, right? Now, near the circle, the atoms are less bound to the other atoms. So, atoms in the surface have more mobility. And here is the air. Air is the path. The molecules are very separated and they move very fast and very easily. That's what they do with a gas and the solid. But metals are not any solid. I will explain that. The metals are, are formed by heavily bound crystalline lack structures. And as the COVID heats to the temperatures that we use in writing, between 180 and 250 degrees, some of the atoms that are near the surface acquire sufficient energy to overcome the molecular forces that are binding them together. Right? And so they can ionize and overcome this binding energy that keeps them bound. And they can move out of the interface directly to the inhaled liquid or into the air, right? So you can identify an interface that is, uh, and we can also identify a very interesting phenomenon called absorption. In absorption, what happens is that later of the uh, different atoms, from both interfaces, they form one after the other. And since uh, we have a, a relatively hot temperature, high temperature, they vibrate and they can be released. So this is one of the phenomena that can explain how nature uh, going to the, the aerosol. But it's not the only phenomenon. There are other phenomena and the physics of surface in the context of the electronic cigarette has not been well studied. It is a very interesting subject worth studying. Okay? So this is how they can come. Now, another interesting thing that also applies to the, to the chemicals that really was discussing is how they are detected. How do you detect them? How do you detect nitrogen and sulfur oxygen? Right? And, and different, different byproducts of the flavoring. How do you detect them? Well, uh, let's see. Okay. We detect them by emission studies using an analytic chemistry. See here, I'm not a chemist. We okay. would like to see the chemical composition in the inhaled aerosol, but we cannot play the sensor in the mouth of somebody or in the throat. So we have to use an aerosol that is generated by vaping machines. These vaping machines have a voice and are adapted to vaping from smoking machines. So and then, and then you have to choose a, a, a public protocol in this machine, right? And here comes the problem because it, there is a, a, this machine will do a very popping. What do I mean by this? Uh, We cannot hear you, Roberto.
So, what shall I do? Ah, okay, shall I use the uh, arrows? Probably. Ah. That would help no, a bit. No, the arrow doesn't work. Okay, okay. So, vaping machines will do typically 50 puffs, each one lasting 4 seconds, every 30 seconds. Now, do you know any human vapor doing this? Well, no. There are no human vapors that do this, right? And uh, if they do that, if they do a sequence of puffs, that, that will be just for a moment, then later they will not do that. You titrate and you don't do this type of things, right? So, uh, can, can people hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Then also, vaping machines do not taste and do not feel. They can be operating and generating an aerosol that for a human user, would be repelled, right? So this is a problem. And another thing is that laboratory testing, uh, it is important, it is important to, uh, to compare products for quality control, and it can also even be important for technological development. But uh, regarding uh, uh, assessment of health risk, they are limited because of what I mentioned. They don't reproduce the human experience. And But if the experiments are well designed, right, they are consistent in several factors, then they can, they can provide an approximate evaluation of health risk from the inhalation of vaping aerosol. Uh, okay. Now, several emission studies have detected very worrying levels of metal in the aerosol, especially nickel, lead, copper, manganese. Chromium also, but normally the levels of chromium are low. Now, these are above toxicological markers. These markers, they are important because they can give you uh, a sense, they are not very accurate, many of them, but they can tell you whether the inhalation of a given substance in a specific dose can be dangerous for your health. It depends on many factors that I don't have time to explain now, but the question is, are these outcomes, these experimental outcomes, are they reliable? Because if they are reliable, then they think can be dangerous because you would be inhaling a lot of metals, right? So let's see if they are reliable. Now, here I'm going to speak about a paper that I am that I'm, I'm collaborating with a colleague, a French physicist, with an experimental. I am a theoretician. And although I have a good knowledge of aerosol physics, it's not my speciality. I'm a, I'm a cosmologist. But physics is physics. So I have been learning over the years, and I've been already publishing. I already have papers in aerosol physics, in electronic cigarettes. And this one, I'm preparing with Sebastian, Sebastian Soulet, a paper. And we are looking at, um, essentially, uh, oh, yeah, okay, I'm not muted, right? Okay, we are reviewing 12 studies <laughs> on methods on electronic cigarettes that were published after 2017. The date is important because uh, studies that were done before were testing devices that are now obsolete, like SIGA lights and so on. So we concentrate on studies that have tested devices that are still being used. What are our findings? What are our findings? And this is very important. What we found is that all, and here I'm meaning all, 
not, not just the majority or whatever. All the studies detecting boring metals, boring levels of metals, have serious methodological flaws. Let me describe what are these flaws. For example, they tested high-powered devices with coughing protocols that are appropriate only for those power devices, right? And uh, this generates some thermodynamical problems uh, that, again, I, I don't have time to explain, but it is explained if you can see my presentation for the event of uh, misinformation that I described more or less what is the problem. And uh, you will get overheating, and overheating favors the production of toxicants, not only metal, but also the carbon use that Mirek mentioned, right? Because electronic cigarettes have to be used between certain temperature ranges. If you overcome those ranges, then you are outside of the optimal regime of operation. And this is what happens with this study. But uh, they, the machines don't complain. The machines are not going to tell you, oh, this aerosol test is awful, or it is too hot. Because it can happen that the devices can be even very hot to, to handle them with, a, with your hands or with your mouth. Another problem is that they tested devices that were acquired years before the experiment. And here you are running the risk of having corrosion of metal degradation. And this have chemical influence on the, the aerosol. And so uh, that's also a bad thing to do. And uh, uh, another thing, another problem is that they have miscalculated the exposures because you have to convert an, a concentration in the aerosol condensate to a concentration in the user's mouth. And uh, these people did not use the right volume, the right inhalation volume, etc. So they conclude that they were above toxicological markers when in reality they were much below. That's another error. And another error, and this is very important, is that many of these articles, not all of them, they are omitting important information on the devices and on their data. They don't report all the data. And this is very bad because you cannot replicate them. And uh, ex good experimental practice means that experiments can be replicated. It's the same in my field in cosmology. Observations have to be replicated, otherwise they are useless, right? So these are the main problems. Now, from here, we can conclude that the alarm on high metals in electronic cigarette aerosol is uh, has a very weak experimental basis. That doesn't mean that future experiments might find something. Like, uh, there is no protocol for direct to long vaping, uh, not the, the cloud chasers, not just uh, uh, some exhibition thing, but people who inhale large aerosols and large volumes of aerosols, there, there is a need for a testing protocol that doesn't exist People still use the correct protocol that is good for for um, for low power devices. And uh, future, we need to do better experiments in the future. But so far, the literature does not support the idea of alarm from metals. And if you hear this information about that, you can be certain that it is based on experiments that have very bad methodological flaws. Sorry for these technical problems. Okay, so it, uh, where ah here here it is. Now let's go to let's make a comparison with air pollution because we always compare with cigarettes. But look, cigarette smoke is so toxic that anything anything you compare it with, unless you talk about cough and venoms like mustard gas or chemical weapons, 
but any consumer product will be less toxic than cigarettes. So let's compare with air pollution, right? And we have to make assumptions on the exposure. And the assumption will be like for vaping, we, call, we assume that a typical vapor will do 250 puffs per day. And the units that we measure that is because metals come in very small doses, right? Come the, uh, the unit we are going to use is nanogram per pump. A nanogram is one part in 1,000 millions of a gram. So it is really a tiny, tiny amount of mass, right? And now for air pollution, we are going to assume four hours of outdoor uh, presence and 20 hours being indoors. But bear in mind that about 60% of the pollution indoors originates outdoors. Now this, of course, depends on the season, depends on the climate, depends on the country, the city, many, many factors, and it can change. It depends on the isolation of the house, whatever. But let's take this average, which is quite general, okay? So, now, for, uh, since uh, I'm not in Poland, I would like to be, but I'm not there, but uh, the, I'm talking to an audience in Poland. So let's choose a study of air pollution in Poland, in Krakow, which is a lovely city, right? So uh, this is a study by Polish authors that was already published recently, I think 2018, and they look at pollution in Krakow, right? It's a very good study. So, what do they, uh, uh, they look at the pollution in Krakow in the summer, in the autumn, in spring, in winter, right? But I'm going to choose summer because the levels of pollution are relatively low. And also there is more outdoor activity and people who are indoor, they, use, they will use natural ventilation, right? So, these are the data that this uh, scientist found. And I'm going to concentrate on summer and on two metals, nickel and lead, because these are the metals that are typically found in studies of emission, right? And also to simplify matters, because if I go metal by metal, then it will take me one hour. Okay, so, and for rating, I'm going to take this study. Uh, this study was uh, published in 2019 by American authors, right? So, this study is seriously flawed in testing suit on devices because of what I mentioned. They tested devices that can run up to 200 watts. You know, they are big devices. And they tested them with a protocol that is, avail that is useful for small devices like for for a jewel or for, for a pod, right? So uh, it's flawed, right? Now, however, when they tested the uh, too close the uh, pod devices, they did it correctly, right? So that's why I'm taking that measure, that is that part of their experiment. And they tested the jewel and the blue. They are both closed uh, pod systems, okay? Now, what are we do all the calculations, right? And uh, these are the results. The results are given as a daily intake of these two metals in nanograms. Remember, nanograms is a very small unit, right? So here, these are the these are the results, right? And so you can see, if you can see my cursor, air pollution is higher, you have a higher intake from air pollution than from the jewel or from the blue, right? But not the subon, see? And here I show you, here I can, if you see these numbers, these numbers are huge, but these numbers correspond to testing a 200 watts monster with a protocol that is that is good for these two guys, right? 
So we can dismiss it. This. this result is completely useless. It doesn't, doesn't serve any purpose. It is, if I had been the referee, I would have rejected that. But, you know, it was published. This, I can illustrate this graphically. It, it is much nicer to illustrate this with these boxes. And here, this is nickel. And as you can see, pollution is much higher intake of nickel than the jewel and the blue. And here, it is lead. Lead is much higher, right? Now, you can ask me what would have happened if you would have tested instead of the jewel and the blue, if you had tested a monster like this. Well, what would have happened is that the levels would be higher, but not much higher if you test that correctly with the right protocol, which is still does not exist, right? It is a, ta a very urgent task in analytic chemistry applied to electronic cigarettes. Now, let's go to another topic here, which is particles. See, there are many studies in the literature and the tractors or vaping, they say particles, particles everywhere. And uh, you have as much particles as, uh, as tobacco smoke. You can have the same numbers and the same diameter of the particles. However, there is always a however, see? Oh, sorry, yeah. Are, they, are the particles of electronic cigarette aerosol dangerous? Absolutely not. They are not dangerous, and I'm going to explain why. This is the way these particles, which are liquid droplets, this is the way they are produced. When we hit the coil, we generate a vapor, a gas, not yet an aerosol. It's a gas, right? It's around, it's, it surrounds the coil. And then when we inhale, we pull this, this vapor, and this vapor cools. And as it cools, uh, as it is cooling, it will condense, right? It will condense and will form liquid droplets that are being transported by the gas. And this is the aerosol that we are inhaling. It is formed by condensation of a vapor made with the same chemical composition as the liquid. It's not what people say is water vapor. No, it's not water vapor. It is a vapor of, of the mixture or of the solution, not mixture, sorry, solution of a, a propylene glycol, a glycerol, nicotine, and water. And this is what forms it, right? So all these compounds are not toxic except for the byproducts that I'm going to talk about quickly, right? Now, when you form this, some metals go inside, go into the aerosol, and they also form particles. These particles are very small, are of the size of nanometers. A nanometer is one part in 1,000 millions of a meter. So it's also it's a very small length. These are very small particles, nanoparticles, but they come in the speakably negligible quantities, right? So when they say metal particles in the aerosol, that's an exaggeration. They come in very, very, very despicably negligible quantities. Now, let's compare with their pollution. Uh, let's compare first the chemistry, right? Or uh, the chemical properties of the different types of particles. Now, vaping aerosol particles are liquid. They are liquid droplets. They are non-toxic. They are made of propylene glycol, glycerol, nicotine, and water, then that makes 99.99, .99, and I think I should have put another nine, because the carbonyl byproducts that are measured in, in the aerosol in general, not only, but also in the particles, it is one part in 1,000. The carbonyl that Mirak mentioned, if you compare with the mass of the aerosol, because you can measure the mass of the 
exhale, inhale and the exhale aerosol. You can measure that. And if you compare it with the mass of the aerosol, they make one part in 1,000. Now, the metal nanoparticles, they make one part in 10 million. So it is really, you cannot really say that these particles are toxic. Now, air pollution. Air pollution PM2.5. PM2.5 means particulated matter of diameter less than 2.5 microns. Micron is, uh, is 1,000, one, one micron is 1,000 nanometers. So it's a slightly larger particles and they are mostly solid, not all of them solid, but mostly solid. They are quite toxic because that produced by combustion sources, most of them, right? And uh, they're composed of complex mixtures of hydrocarbons, nitrates, sulfates, metallic compounds are also in these particles, and the uh, crustal material, which means dust and minerals. And uh, these particles, when they are in the atmosphere, they undergo chemical reactions, especially photochemical, they are affected by the light, by the sun. They, they vary with day and night. And, uh, and then they also oxidizing reactions. So these particles are, are of concern. And on the other hand, the, uh, the particles of electronic cigarette are not. Now, let's see the physical properties. We, we talk about the chemical properties. Now let's look at the physical properties. It, oh, again, uh, sorry, okay. Vaping aerosol particles are volatile, see? Especially propylene glycol, water, and nicotine are quite volatile substances. So they evaporate very fast. The volatility is like facility to evaporate. They evaporate very fast. And what remains of the droplets is a small nucleus of, of uh, glycerin, uh, uh, glycerol, which is much less volatile than the other ones, and it's also a heavier molecule, so it tends to stay in the particles, but it is a reduced particle, and these particles, because they are relatively light, molecular weights are relatively light, not, uh, uh, of course, glycerol is heavier, but it's still not very heavy, and, uh, and so, and it moves very fast, like a gas, and it disperses very fast. And partly it disperses because it is not in chemical equilibrium with the surrounding air, but it is not in thermodynamical equilibrium, sorry, not chemical. It is not in thermal equilibrium, so it relaxes very fast to thermal equilibrium where the environmental air is acting like a thermal bath, right? So it, uh, it, it uh, dilutes very, very fast. Now, what happens with uh, what happens with air pollution? They are not volatile. The majority of the compounds are either semi-volatile or volatile or, or non-volatile. Some are volatile as well. It is mixed, right? But the majority are not volatile. Now, they do not evaporate. Some evaporate. The volatile ones evaporate but not all of them, like some nitric oxides and so on, they might evaporate, but other ones don't. Now, they are more, it is mostly in uh, outdoor, uh, uh, but also um, it, uh, we have to consider that they think aerosol is visible. Visibility uh, comes from the way that, the, that light is dispersed in the aerosol and liquid particles do not absorb rather they disperse the light, right? And uh, it has a localized scope. It's a microenvironment. It, 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 it is undetectable at two meters of distance and, and uh, one meter after, one, uh, one minute after the pop, it's completely undetectable. Not even in picograms, will, you will see it. Now, uh, air pollution, on the other hand, is not visible. It becomes visible if it interacts with water vapor or other volatile gases, and then it might interact with them. And then we have what is called smog. Smog is the particles that pass 
they are not really smoke, but they are these particles of air pollution interacting with fog. And then we see it. This is when we see the pollution. But typically, it's not visible. And it has a very wide extension, right? So essentially, and here I'm concluding, here are the, uh, the summary of everything that I've said here. Uh, oh, OK, metals. All studies detecting high metal contents are wrong. They are wrong, and they can. And uh, I explain the reasons why they are wrong, and I'm ready. We are going to um, submit this paper, and uh, we are ready to discuss everything and show show why they are wrong. Right now, all methodologically sound right experiments or methods have detected levels that are well beyond the toxicological markers, the occupational, environmental, and medicinal toxicological markers are well below, two orders of magnitude below, right? And uh, particles, well, the particles of electronic cigarette have absolutely nothing to do with particles of tobacco smoke that we call tar. Tar is tobacco aerosol residue, these are the particles of the that are of the of the principal emission, not the side stream, but these particles they they have nothing to do with them and nothing to do with the particles of air pollution, right? So when people uh, the tractors are vaping, they make us a, a scare about that. They don't have any scientific ground for that, not even in physics, and not in chemistry. Okay, so I think. Uh, I would like to end here and thank you very much for your attention. Thanks very much, Roberto. So now we have some time and some minutes for questions. You are, you are the first. Yeah, I actually have two questions. My, my previous question was um, the uh, illegal manufacturer, the illegal manufacturers uh, that caused uh, Evali adding uh, vitamin E acetate. Why were they doing that to begin with? What was their purpose? Well, well, they want to make a liquid that will contain tetrahydrocannabinol or other similar compounds and now we have something like this we have a molecule of tetrahydrocannabinol which is not very polar so it cannot be diluted with polar solvents like propylene glycol glycerol etc so they thought let's use something that will be an interface let's look at this open the gray or silvery part it's a tocopheryl and the red part is an acetate so we have non-polar part here and polar part here that's something quite similar when we use soap. Soap is a chemical molecule that is partly nonpolar and it sticks to the dirt and partly polar which sticks to water. And here the mechanism is quite similar. I mean nonpolar part sticks to tetrahydrocannabinol and the polar part sticks to propylene glycol or, or VG or water. And then when it goes into the lungs, it becomes quite dangerous because our lungs are used to only to polar chemicals. They are covered, the alveoli are covered with water, in fact. And when we put some non-polar, or at least partially non-polar compound there, it stays because it cannot dissolve in water. There, 
the organism cannot get rid get rid of that of that compound. So this is the only purpose they are using it because they could not, at least not yet, they could not find a chemical that will act as an interface be between non-polar THC and polar solvent of the liquid. Yes. Yes, thank you uh, for the very informative presentations. I'd like, I'd just like to share an, uh, an adverse event reported uh, regarding one vapor. Uh, this is, well, this is a very anecdotal, isolated case. Uh, but a colleague of ours reported a vapor who developed uh, a severe metallic taste, uh, which led to severe anorexia and the vapor lost more than 50% of uh, his uh, normal weight he was not really obese or overweight, so just imagine if you lose fifty percent of the weight. Uh, fortunately for the vapor, the the the, the metallic taste uh, uh, dissipated after a few months, and uh, he regained. Uh, he, he's back to normal. So, the, well, as as pointed out by Professor Roberto, this is. Uh, this may not. This is not something you expect uh, regularly, yeah, because uh, the uh, level of uh, we we attribute it to lead poisoning. Uh, the level of lead is extremely small, so this might be a case of uh, hypersensitivity to to lead. I don't know if we have similar reports elsewhere. So this is an isolated case. So we would just like to share with the rest of uh, our colleagues here and uh, to to see if there are also other reports elsewhere. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Uh, well, probably they are such. There are some such cases all over the world, and I would be very happy to uh, see the studies concerning even those single cases, because we then we just gather knowledge we gather information and this information is quite uh, important uh, well i mentioned uh, nickel uh, allergy uh, a, one girl 19 or 20 uh, asked me uh, whether it can be a case of nickel allergy because she was using a metal mouthpiece and her lips were swollen, she had problems with breathing and so on and so on. So I advised her, well, just try to switch to plastic mouthpiece. And the problem is gone, just like this. So that was just contact, so-called contact allergy, not an allergy, in inhalation allergy, because still, probably a minute, small amounts of nickel, she was inhaling also, but just like Roberto said, one in 10 million parts, and that was not a problem. The problem was by the contact, contact of mouth of the lip with metal parts. Well, incidentally, my daughter also is allergic to nickel. She, now, she even cannot use watches with metal parts because they usually contain at least a bit of nickel, she got the rash and so on. Yeah, uh, something important is that uh, a source of toxicity can be uh, in vapors that do not give proper maintenance to the to their electronic cigarettes because you know, I, what, what I'm speaking is uh, assuming that you uh, give proper maintenance, that you change your coils when it's necessary, uh, and uh, that you, uh, if you are going to store your e-liquids or your bathing gear, that you do not store it for months, right? This can be a source of toxicity, but in this respect, uh, we should say that electronic cigarettes 
are like any other consumer products, right? If you have a car and you never tune it up, you never check the brakes, uh, you don't give maintenance to that car, that car can be dangerous, can put your life in risk. So it would be interesting to know if the case that you mentioned, the person had given proper maintenance to his gear or her gear, I don't know the sex of that person, right? So that's one source of toxicity. And then another thing is that human biology is complicated. Like when you talk, when we talk about chemistry and about compounds and about toxicity and about particles and how they are generated and so on, uh, we cannot uh, make predictions on human health. Human health is complicated. It, uh, human biology, the analogy is with buildings. If you have, uh, if you want, uh, uh, if you have uh, a lot of building material, you can build, uh, theoretically, you could build a very tall building. Not necessarily. Chemistry is a necessary but not sufficient condition for disease, right? You can have a, a, a small, a, a very mild chemistry and still produce toxicity because there is an enormous variation among people, right? Some people are allergic to, uh, I don't know, to uh, concert money, you say, uh, to peanuts. Some people are allergic to peanuts or to things that we consider completely harmless. Human biology is complicated, right? But we cannot take isolated cases as representative. We have to give them the proper statistical weight, right? Uh, I wanted to ask Roberto a question. Uh, you didn't compare, give us any comparison of uh, vaping and metals and cigarette or combustible uh, inhalation and metals. I'm assuming I'll let you respond. Yeah, yeah. Um, there are also metals in a, in a tobacco smoke, and they are in similar concentrations, right? Very small, like uh, you know, tobacco and uh, heavy metals are just a tiny fraction of the toxicity uh, of, uh, of tobacco smoke. And also we have to emphasize that they come from different roots. I explain more or less how uh, metals come into electronic cigarette aerosol, but that's not the way they come into cigarettes. The way they come into cigarettes is because they already exist in the tobacco plant. The tobacco plant is exposed to the atmosphere. The atmosphere has metals, right? And so this metal deposit in the plant, and when the nicotine is synthesized from the plant, they come along. They are in minute quantities, also parts per billion, right? In nanograms, right? And so what happens is that uh, there, are, there are different metals, like in, in, in tobacco smoke, the most abundant metal is cadmium and then mercury and then also lead. Lead is probably the only common element. There are different metals from the metals that you find in electronic cigarette and they come from different roots. They can have very similar concentrations, but uh, there, uh, it is uh, both, uh, in both cases, there are, there are very small concentrations, also in tobacco smoke. So in one study, published in 2013, they found out that nickel, because nickel is important in electronic cigarettes, but nickel is irrelevant for tobacco smoke, right? So they say, oh, we found 200 times more nickel in electronic cigarettes than in tobacco smoke. But what they didn't say, that if you have 200 times times something that is so negligible, it will still be negligible. So it's a valid comparison, but we have to bear in mind that there are different metals and they come from different different groups, right? Another question here? 
Yes, please. I'll, I'll ask my last question. <laughs> So uh, given what you both said, particularly, um, I'm curious and I'm also thinking about I'm working with a very vulnerable population uh, who would have more challenges using open systems and uh, in the research that I've been doing, we're using only a closed system. Uh, would it be fair to say, if, with given all the variables, that closed systems may actually be exposing people to less toxins than open systems? I would say so. I would say so because, you know, uh, when you use a closed system, then you have less chance to manipulate the liquid. And with open systems, well, I know plenty of people that were experimenting with such compounds that I, I would not even not mention them. <laughs> Thank you. Well, you know, uh, I think that we have to uh, to put some nuances in this classification of open and closed. Like you can have a closed system, like this jewel, but you but you can also have a pod. You can also have a pod with low power. Uh, it's not very different from the jewel, but that you can put liquids in it. And uh, I think that uh, the, the main dividing line is not so much between open and closed, but between the power. Like if you have a low power device, then all these uh, byproducts, whether carbonyls and metals and nit nitrosamines are also detected in parts per billion, right? So, but the level of these pollutants will be much smaller in, if you use low power, right? If you use high power, like if you take a monster like this, right? I, I barely use it. Like if you take a monster like this and if you inhale like two liters of, of air, and the and the pop volume can be 500 milliliters, and the temperatures can easily rise if you break the equilibrium. If you use it within the optimal regime that can be determined by laboratory, then it will be more than the than the low power, but it will keep a linear relation, right? It will still be manageable, but it depends on the user. If the user exaggerates and wants to have a big, big, big cloud and, and also doesn't give proper maintenance, then this can be toxic. Yeah, for vulnerable population, you are right. But the dividing line is power and responsibility of the user to keep the gear in good conditions, right? This is important. I must emphasize many people who use vapes who are young adults or maybe even teenagers or whatever they are not responsible in using it but this would be a problem also for any other consumer product, right so how do we solve this i think by education and by preventive measures to tell people it's not enough to go to the vape shop and buy your gear you have to use it properly. You have to take care of it. It's a responsibility. That's why it is important to be an adult pro, because adults will be more responsible in using it than teenagers, right? But the dividing line is power, and the emphasis is in the correct usage of the devices. If you use them correctly, then the production of byproducts toxic byproducts will be under control. Thank you for your speech. Um, as you mentioned, um, uh, regarding the nicotine levels, uh, missing scientific justification in European Union policy is important issue in many areas regarding vaping. And uh, currently, the European Union public consultation is underway to review current tobacco product directive. 
And uh, one of changes being considered uh, is flavor ban on e-cigarettes. And recent uh, research studies show that flavors are essential in um, smoking cessations. And yeah, regarding the whole topic of um, Global Nicotine Forum, um, what do you think? Might the flavor ban strongly affect the discuss discussion about additional substances in liquids and the future of uh, cigarettes as smoking cessation method? Thank you. Uh, well, the flavor ban, that's something that makes me a bit nervous because when you smoke cigarettes, cigars or pipe, then you have, in fact, no choice. You have a tobacco smoke, tobacco flavor. And plenty of people, you know, I am a vapor since two 2009, I met plenty of people who were very, very happy to have different flavors, fruit flavors, a coffee flavor, etc. Even, even bacon flavor, <laughs> something absolutely not for me, uh, but you can choose from different different flavors and can find something to get rid of tobacco flavor personally i'm just using the base that means nicotine propylene glycol glycerin and i add just a drop of menthol and menthol may be also banned and that is something ridiculous absolutely ridiculous of course they will try to tell us hey but there are plenty of compounds they can be dangerous 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 but as roberto said they can be dangerous but not in those quantities as paracelsus said only the dose makes the poison so we have to think about it, but unfortunately, I'm pretty sure the European Union will still fight e-cigarettes, fight with liquids, fight with flavors. And he, we have this our duty to oppose to that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think that the bands of flavor are an attempt to degrade the product. Because, let's face it, the establishment from the WHO below, and well, it's a complicated uh, political problem why they oppose so much electronic cigarettes. It has an angle of a technocracy that is threatened by a disruptive technology, etc. It's, it's a big topic. But they don't like electronic cigarettes. There, there is a disgust on electronic cigarettes. Now, they cannot ban it in the European Union or in the United States or in Canada. In rich countries, they cannot ban it. So they degrade it. Let's degrade it. And I think uh, it's this idea that if you are smoking, and that's horrible, if you are smoking, okay, let's agree with that. It's horrible. But then, uh, you cannot quit smoking in a recreational way. You have to quit smoking in abstinence, in the software and so on, because you are a smoker. Now, if you quit smoking in a recreational way, with flavors, with slick designs, with new technology and so on, that's not, the, that's not in the script for this technocracy. So, I, uh, and also, the reason that they you that they say for banning flavors that if they attract teenagers that there is no demographic support for that like if i take a 16 year old guy 16 year old girl or boy and i tell them would you what would you prefer um cherry pie or apple pie 
or or the uh, glandular or, or or the emission from from a from a fox from the anus of a fox <laughs> well you know uh, teenagers like flavors because humans like flavors you, of course the teenagers like creamy flavors and so on so that's not true that that's like if you have a a small tumor here and you cut the whole arm so yeah if there are no flavors and by the way tobacco flavor is also flavor the only flavor less is to use only the solvents and nicotine so tobacco flavor is is not tobacco it's a combination of chemicals that mimics tobacco but it, it is absolutely indefensible, this policy, and I think we should oppose it because many vapors will not feel it's a degradation of the product. Why should people be forced to use a degraded product, right? So many vapors will go back to smoking. I would go back to smoking if there are no flavors. Okay, I guess it's the high time because it's over 10 minutes, we are 10 minutes late, so thank you everyone for coming here. If you have any questions, feel free to ask me direct. Thank you, Roberto. Now you yeah, might go to sleep. <laughs>